Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21 it is a, a beautiful, powerful prayer from the Apostle Paul over the Ephesian believers that he's writing to and over the whole church at that time and all the way through to every nation and generation, including us. And I just keep coming back to this prayer so many times and, uh, well, that will never stop because it's so rich and deep and powerful. And I wanted us to take a little bit of time this morning to, to, um, to pick up some things that maybe we don't necessarily notice uh, when we read through this because it might be familiar to us. And so in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, here is Paul's prayer. And by the way, you will notice uh, perhaps after our series in the Lord's Prayer that there are things that, that Paul incorporates as he prays that are reflective of how Jesus taught us to pray. It's not a mirror image, of course, as we said throughout that whole series. The point of that was never to say, here are the words to pray, but here is how to pray. And here is what you need to know about who it is that you're speaking with as you pray and what he is like and what he does and what he's asking us to partner with uh, along, along with him. So here's what he says. Uh, Paul in Ephesians 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. There it is. Well done. Some of you passed the test from last week. I was wondering. Well done. It's great to hear your amen to that. We want to be an amen kind of people. And as I told you last week, that may or may not mean that you speak the amen uh, out loud in a service. I hope you do. That would be great. But it's okay if you don't. It's not okay if we fail to be an amen with our lives. Our lives are called to be an amen to the word of God. And so uh, I, I appreciate the encouragement already uh, for, you, uh, for you sharing your amen this morning. So he starts with this, uh, this phrase, for this reason. And of course, you know, you have to take a look backwards to understand what reason is he talking about. And there's obviously far more there than we're going to unpack this morning. But I wanted to just give you a highlight of what's been happening before he says, for this reason, I pray over you in this way. If you were to look back into the previous chapter, there's a theme that's going on as Paul is, is letting these Ephesian believers know, most of whom were Gentiles, and so most of whom uh, were experiencing this being brought in to the people and the kingdom of God, which was not always a smooth process, obviously. It was not always an easy thing for people who were the people of God as uh, as. Uh, as the Jewish people, but also people who never saw themselves as the people of that God, as Gentile people, and God was bringing them together through Christ, and so Paul had been describing all of that and how it works. And some of the things that he said in the previous chapter, like, for example, in verse 12, he said, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. And of course, by the way, the, the, the dividing line here that he's talking about uh, is, uh, is not just about Jew and Gentile, but it's illustrative of people uh, who, are, who have become the family of God and people who, have not, who were not part of the family of God. 
And so it doesn't, don't get hung up on the fact that it's just a matter of, you know, Jews and Gentiles becoming the family of God together, but it's also uh, people who had no place in God's family, who had no relationship with God, who had no hope of having any relationship with God except for Christ. And so through Christ, he's bringing people into his family. And that's part of what Paul's talking about when he says, remember that. Remember. No matter what your story, no matter where you grew up, no matter who shared the gospel with you at a young age or even over the past couple of weeks or months or years, whatever your story, remember, church, that at one time you were separate from Christ. I don't need to go into have you just think for a moment about the implications of the people of God forgetting that we were separate from Christ at one point. Think about it at some point. Remember that you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's awesome. And it's more awesome if you remember that at one time you were separate, excluded, without hope, without God, and far away. And if you remember that, then that little phrase, now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near, becomes mind-blowing, heart-exploding, life-changing, awesome. Later on in verse 19, he says, Consequently, as a result, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, hallelujah, but fellow citizens with God's people. Awesome. You are members of his household and built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Wow. Just awesome. I mean, not only is God taking a whole nationality that he had set aside at his people and engrafting everybody else to also be a part of his people, but he's taking all of us who were once far away, excluded, without, no hope, no God, no nothing, bringing us in to be members of his household, citizens in his kingdom, near parts of his family, and he's building all of us together across languages and nations and generations to become a dwelling place in which what? God lives by his Holy Spirit. Wow. It is just unbelievable how big and how amazing that is. And that's why when Paul prays for us then in the next chapter, he says, I just pray that you will have strength and power to be able to grasp this. I pray that you may have, uh, you know, Christ dwelling in your hearts through faith, that you will be rooted and established in love. You need power to be able to grasp together with the Lord's holy people Just how wide and long and high and deep is this kind of love? The story that we've just touched on here over the past four minutes is the most astonishing thing that any of us could imagine in our existence. It really is. And so that's why Paul says, I'm praying that you will have power and strength and faith in your inner being to be able to grasp this, to be able to to hold to this, to understand this, the love of Christ that would bring you from far outside, enemies of God, running away, no hope, excluded, foreigners and aliens, into being members and citizens and family members. The love of Christ, which would do that Not to mention the price that he paid to demonstrate that love. To do all of that is so big, so great, so life-changing, so world-changing that I pray that the Holy Spirit will empower you with strength in your inner being so that you can grasp it. There's a lot in there. That you'll be able to know this love, which is beyond knowledge. 
that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. But I want you to see together with me this morning that there is more than just knowing in this prayer. There's more than just grasping in this prayer. Paul is not just praying that we will get it, that we will you know, believe it, that we will grasp it, that we will know it. Many of you have studied this passage and this book and this gospel for years, and, and you would never say, I get it all, you know, I grasp it all. You know, you understand why you need power to grasp more and more all the time, but you basically get the point. But this is not the totality of Paul's prayer. He's not just saying, I pray for power so that you will get it, understand it, grasp it, know it. It's not just about grasping and knowing. Did you see the word in there, filling? It's about filling. He says that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time to unpack this, but just think with me for a moment and you'll get exactly what I mean. What's filling for? We have in our refrigerator, maybe you have one of these, we have a, a pitcher of water in our refrigerator. It's a whole you know, filter thing. And uh, you know how it goes if you're a family and you have one of those things in your, in your fridge uh, that it's a little bit irritating when you pull it out and there's nothing in it. And the filter's dry and you're like, forget it. So my very smart wife, at some point along the way, in our family of six who drink a lot of water and put the thing right back in there, she just wrote with a, a nice shiny marker on the top, fill me. And uh, ever since then, uh, I wouldn't say 100% of the time, okay, not even close to 100% of the time, but a lot more of the time when someone gets water, they fill it. What's filling for? There's my little story. Think of any story you want. You fill your gas tank. You fill your bank account, maybe, if you're fortunate. I don't know. You fill Whatever. Think about anything you fill. The only reason why we ever fill something is because we're going to do something with it. Right? The only reason why anything ever needs to be filled is because there's something to be done. Correct? Yeah. Now look what he says. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God... Now to him, verse 20, who is able to, what? Do. Immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Doing what is the question. Right? Doing what? We'll take a look. Immeasurably more. All right. Well, that's great. To do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. That's great. Okay. Immeasurably more what? To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Throughout all generations. Now, a lot of you are good alliance people. And you know the heartbeat of our movement has been to know Jesus personally and deeply and from that place to take the gospel to the ends of the world, to all nations. Let me just make this quick observation about us and this passage. If it said, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all nations, forever and ever, amen. What would we do with that? What would we think about that? We know we would. This would be this would be on our our banners. This would be on our stuff. This would be on our missions conference themes. This would be all over the place as Alliance people who are passionate about bringing the gospel to people who don't have access to it around the world. We would carry this as a banner, as the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And, and there are many, many places, obviously, all throughout the scripture that talk about that very heart of God that we share together, partner with our whole Alliance family, and we're all about bringing the hope of Jesus to all people in all places, in all languages. And then, after the gospel is preached in all of those ways and places, the end will come. That's our heartbeat. But did you notice here that that's not the word that he uses? Here he says... 
throughout all generations. So what will we do if we know that if it said nations, we would roll up our sleeves and get to work together to bring back the king by the proclamation of the gospel to all nations and all peoples? If we know what we would do then, what will we do because it says generations? I want you to know Paul says that you need strength and power. I want you to have strength and power to be rooted and established. You need to understand the love of Christ. That's one big idea here, obviously, right? You need power to understand the love of Christ. But there's another big idea here. Understand this, that when you are filled with the wide and long and high and deep love of Christ... His power works through you to build his church and bring him glory for generations. That's what it says. This past Wednesday, Wednesday morning, a very average, typical Wednesday morning at Asbury University, a young man uh, who serves in the Christian Missionary Alliance uh, on our Envision, in our Envision ministry was the chapel speaker this past Wednesday. Uh, Zach Mirkrebs spoke a message uh, to Asbury University uh, a student body from Romans 12 about comparisons and competitions and all of those kind of world values in contrast to the kingdom uh, and the values of the kingdom. And at the end of that message, he uh, called for a time of response and of confession. And about 100 students responded in, uh, in confession. And, and it was it, by no means expected, obviously, if you've ever been, some of you who have been maybe Bible college students or seminary students, whatever, you know chapel can be great, it can be powerful, it can be amazing, but also it can be, you know, pretty routine. It can be like average Wednesday morning, get in the chapel, get out, get your stuff done, go to class, whatever. But on this time, as Zach preached the word of God, uh, students fell on their knees in confession and in repentance. And what has happened since then, that chapel service has not yet to this hour stopped. There is another massive wave of revival underway at Asbury University right now as we're meeting here. That has not stopped. Some, some began to leave and, and, then, and then they started to come back. The worship hasn't stopped. The confession hasn't stopped. The repentance hasn't stopped. The prayer hasn't stopped. You can, and, and here's what's unique about this. This is one of the first times in, in, in our modern time, for sure, obviously, that one of these uh, revival outbreaks has happened in the era of uh, commun high-level high communication, social media, etc. cetera. So, so when you go home today, you can just go look it up. Uh, the website uh, for Asbury, uh, the Asbury Collegian has already crashed. Uh, because everyone's trying to find out, but there's lots and lots of places you can see it. You can see videos. People are uh, from other colleges and universities, not just the ones around that Lexington, Kentucky area, uh, but also from uh, across state lines are busing their students in. Parents are traveling into Asbury University to be a part of it. People are seeing it worldwide and are praying into it. And the people there are praying back over those communities, uh, over uh, international boundaries. There is a giant revival uh, outbreak happening right now on the campus of Asbury University. Praise the Lord. 1970, the same thing happened. In fact, it was the exact same time of year. A man preached the word of God in a chapel service. That chapel service went on for 10 days. For 10 days, people were weeping and, and confessing and repenting and being healed. And there were miraculous uh, healing outbreaks. And people were called to serve in ministry and overseas. And eventually, uh, Asbury University started sending teams of students who were there at that outbreak of revival. Those students went to share the story in other universities and colleges. And the, and the revival broke out there as well, where another whole wave of people were called into holiness 
witness and called into a ministry and called into worldwide missions. That's happening right now, too. It's a pretty awesome thing that's going on right now among that generation. And it's happening right now at Asbury, uh, Asbury University. There's a whole lot more that could be said about that. Well, obviously, the news is very fresh. It's coming through rapidly and fully, and I definitely can't unpack all of it for you this morning. But the Alliance is, uh, is, is uh, uh, encouraging and supporting and praying uh, over this time and has asked us as part of the Alliance family to do the same. They're asking that we pray for the pastors and leaders at these colleges and churches around the country they're opening their chapels and sanctuaries for the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they're asking that we pray for discernment and wisdom and rest as they continue to uh, lead their communities. By the way, professors and administrators are bringing in food and water along the way to keep the students going as they continue to encounter God in that place. They're asking that we pray for a spirit of radical humility and repentance that would continue to move across the communities in which God's bringing revival. Pray for continued salvations, calls to the nations, miraculous healings, all of which are taking place. Pray for the Lord to show you the ways that he might be asking uh, us to be facilitators of a moment of expect, uh, expectancy in our local church and community. And pray most importantly that the name of Jesus Christ would be exalted in more communities as the day progresses. More and more uh, of this will continue to happen as God moves upon the hearts of a generation that has been so broken and so devastated by cultural decay, by biblical deconstructionism, and they are lost and abandoned from the very one that's calling them to be a part of their family. Unless we take seriously our call as the church to bring him glory in all generations the same way we would do uh, to our, our call to bring his hope to the nations. I want to point this out to you from Isaiah 58. If you're familiar with Isaiah 58, you know that, uh, that, there, that there's this whole uh, conversation that God is having through the prophet Isaiah to his people. And, and the, the, there's all kinds of the same kinds of uh, decay and and an and abandonment of truths and principles and foundations that God gave to his people to be a strong people. And as a result, there's, there's, this, there's sin and there's depravity and there's, there's heartbreak and there's destruction and there's mayhem and there's confusion and there's chaos. And in a lot of ways, if you were to look at the picture of that time and place, it would mirror a lot of what we see in our own time uh, in which young generations are living now uh, along with us. And in Isaiah 58, God confronts them and, and he talks about how, you know, you, you, okay, you're fasting, you're praying, and you're all frustrated that your prayers aren't being answered, that God's not really responding to your, to your fast. And he's saying, like, I mean, your, your fasts have become all about you. You're trying to look religious, you're trying to look self-important, you're trying to you know, go through the motions, and you are missing the fact that there is devastation right there on your doorstep, there is heartbreak right there on your doorstep, and you don't care. But what you do care about is going through the religious motions and looking the part and you know, fasting with a long, sullen face so that everyone can say, well, how spiritual you are. And he's saying, is that the kind of fast that I want? Of course not. I'm not trying to starve you. I want us to spend time together so that I can fill you to do something together for the generation that's dying around you. And so, eventually, he comes to, uh, to start saying, if you will respond in a different way, here's what I'll do. And I'm just going to take a small portion of this from verse 9 uh, uh, through 12. If you will do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of the finger and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and you will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a, like a spring whose waters never fail. Listen to this carefully. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins. And will raise up the age-old foundations. Another way that that's put is the foundations of generations. And you will be called repairers of broken walls. Restorers of streets with dwellings. When we look around and we see 
brokenness and chaos and confusion and despair and all kinds of truths that were good for our country and good for people to to grow and to thrive. And and we see these things being broken down and and challenged and torn to bits. It's, It's easy for us to stand and to point fingers and to speak with malicious talk and to rail against it all. But remember, God's asking us to be filled with him, filled with his power, filled with his heart, so that we can together do something Not just look like something or say something, but do something together. And he's saying that if if you will participate with me and and change your perspective on the people that that are broken and hurting and lost and rebellious and aggravating and irritating or whatever, if you will change your perspective on them, then I'm going to change things in you and the very things that you've been praying for the whole time. I know that we see things and we're frustrated and we're concerned about what's maybe taking place in our nation, in our world. In fact, I read this. I thought it was, uh, someone shared this with me. I thought it was really, uh, really a a great picture. Dennis Prager uh, says this. If you cut flowers from the soil that nurture them, you could look at the flower and for a couple of days, it doesn't look like it needs the soil that nurtured it, but it will wither and die. This is how it is with ethics in the Western world. They were nurtured in religious Judeo-Christian soil. Rip those ethics from that soil and they will last for a generation or two, just like the flower will for a day or two, and then they will wither and die. That is exactly what we see happening now. That is why the founders of our country wrote that we have inalienable rights from the Creator. There are no inalienable rights from human beings. There are only inalienable rights if there is something that transcends the human, and that is the creator. It makes sense. But here's the question. As we look at millennials, and we look at Generation Z, and we maybe get filled with frustration and concern and heartbreak over what we see, Who pulled the flower from the soil? It wasn't them. They still were doing it. It was the generations before them. That's who pulled the flower from the soil. And so I believe God's calling us to a heart change and an attitude change as the church so that we will not participate in the belittling, and in the malicious slander and the criticism and the ridicule of generations that deeply, profoundly need Jesus. There's still a lot of ground to cover. Are you okay? We're going to transition this in just a moment, but let me just break that down for you really quickly. Here's what we just read in Isaiah 58. Here's five things he's calling us to do. Commit to banish every form of oppression in our lives, in our church, in our society, in our attitudes, everywhere, everywhere. Number two, remove scornful accusation, criticism, harmful comparison of others. Number three, refuse to spread or repeat malicious slander. Number four, spend yourself with compassion to serve the needs of others. And number five, comfort those enduring suffering and tragedy. Look at the generations and you'll see there's a field right there where all of these things need to happen from us to them. If we do, here's what we're promised. Our light and our influence will increase Our discouragement will fade. Our decisions will be clearly guided. Our needs will be met with renewing grace for strength and endurance, even in very hard times that we ourselves might go through. Our spiritual lives will flourish and thrive and be fruitful. And as a result, our lives will be a refreshing source of blessing for others. 
our people, meaning like our kids, our church, our community of Christ around this city, our people will restore forgotten truths, principles, and institutions that were foolishly rejected long ago. Our legacy foundations will be raised up again out of rubble and generations will be restored. Our testimony, we get to be called together healers of cities and those who restore communities and families. All of what I've just shared there is right there in Isaiah 58 verses 9 through 12. And it's an invitation for us. And I'm excited that this is exactly what God has been up to among us as a church family. And I'm calling us together as a church family to take seriously not only our call to the nations, but our call to generations.